changing the thoughts and the emotions that you have on a daily basis that say, you can't do this. Right. Change those to be more supportive of you going forward. That changes your beliefs. Yeah. And once those beliefs start to, the old ones that you were carrying that said, I'm too old, I can't do this. Yeah. I'll never be able to pass. Right. Or any of those feelings. Once we get rid of those, it's amazing how everything just begins to evolve. Hi, I'm Biz Cush, a life coach and therapist, and your host here on the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. We're talking to women all over the world who found their way back to themselves, to their inner knowing, to their intuition, to their wisest self. We're exploring how to feel alive, authentic, engaged, and fully present in your life. Let's awaken your wise woman. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. I am Biz Kush, your host and the creator of this podcast. If you've listened and enjoyed the episodes and they speak to you or feel like they might speak to someone in your world, I would love it if you shared the podcast with your friends because. That's how other people find us is through word of mouth. And I know some of you have already shared that. And I really, really appreciate that. And today my guest is amazing. And I'm always so grateful for guests who are willing to be open and honest and share what their life journeys have been, the struggle and also the successes as they've stepped into midlife with fullness and authenticity. And today's guest is no different. But before we jump into that, the this season, season four of the podcast is winding down. We have uh, just, including this episode, just three more episodes left. So we will wrap it up at the end of June. And we'll be back in September with all new guests. Throughout the summer, I will share some of the episodes on repeat so you can hear them again in case you missed them. And I'll be sharing any other updates that might be relevant, you know, maybe marketing the group or whatever, but new guests will start again in September and I'm super excited for the next round of the podcast. If you're a listener of the podcast and haven't subscribed to my newsletter, you can do that through my website, elizabethcushcoaching.com. Each month I write a longer essay and share some updates about my life as well as updates for both my therapy and coaching businesses. You will also get the show notes for each podcast episode as it airs. So typically you get about three emails a month from me, unless I'm marketing my group or something like that, where you might get a couple more. So if you're interested in staying in touch, that's the best way to do it. And I hope you do. This week on the podcast, our guest is Wendy Cole. She is a trans woman who transitioned when she was 67 years old and her story of what it was like knowing from a young age that her gender didn't fit who she truly was is painful and beautiful at the same time. Wendy is so willing and open to share what it was like for her throughout her life and where she is now living fully and authentically as a woman. So I hope you will tune in and listen, and I'd love any feedback you might have. Let's jump in to my conversation with Wendy Cole. Hi, Wendy, and welcome to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. 
Hi, Elizabeth. I'm so uh, happy to be here. This is great. Oh, it's so nice to have you. And I'm really excited about having a, an in-depth conversation with you. But before we get started, if you could share a little bit about yourself and what inspires you. Well, just to put everything out there for the audience, I've always had this feeling of not belonging my entire life. And there are times I didn't even know if I belonged to myself. <laughs> you mm -hmm. see, I was born in the last century. I was born transgender. I transitioned in 2015. And now nine years later, I'm living in alignment with who I am, how I feel. I've achieved self-awareness, self-acceptance. And for the first time in my life, actually self-love. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, it's much less about transitioning from somebody I wasn't and more about becoming who I always have been. Mm. After all, I was never really a man. Gender is between the ears, not between the legs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they check you out when you're born. Yeah. And in terms of what I've learned over the last nine years, Everything that I've gone through facing this profound life change, mm -hmm. everything I've learned applies to everybody else facing life changes. We mm. all go through the same thing. Yeah. yeah. It all has to do with mindset. And as far as I'm concerned, all life change begins and is 80% between your ears. Yeah. Well, and I would imagine... I mean, you said born in the last century, but like as a child at that time, knowing that your sex didn't fit your gender, if mm -hmm. I'm saying that right, mm -hmm. that must have been a hard realization for you, your family. I, and I don't know yeah. whether you knew that at, from what age. Yeah. I had a sense of it from around three. Wow. And by the time I was five, six, I knew there was a difference between me and the girls that I was playing with when I went to mm -hmm. go visit my mother's friends. Mm -hmm. I knew there was a difference. And by 10, I couldn't hold it back anymore. It was that powerful. Wow. And I told my parents. And I did that in my own unique way. <laughs> yeah. I, I dressed up in my mother's clothes, whatever I could find that would fit. Did mm. my makeup, did my nails and waited for my mother to come home from grocery shopping and told her, I'm a girl. Boy. I've had to go through a lot over the last nine years because it caused a, a real fissure in my relationship with my parents, especially my father. He really wanted a son and went through um. all kinds of hoops to get one and was delighted when I arrived. Okay. But... By age 10, that was very difficult with him. Yeah. He was, yeah. I've come to the realization that both my parents were products of their ge generation. Yeah. They were protecting me from society. Yeah. Because yeah. they knew only too well that society would not accept the fact that this little boy, born and assigned male at birth based on my physical anatomy, didn't match how my brain was wired. Right. In the second trimester of birth, when sexual differentiation begins to occur, mm -hmm. it's not common, but it's not uncommon either. That yeah. something goes awry and the body goes with one gender and the brain goes with the other. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm convinced that's what happened with me from everything I've read. Yeah. And I struggled with that from age 10. Mm -hmm. By the time another major pivotal point came in my life, graduating from college. Wow. What do you do with the rest of your life? That's another big change. Oh, and yeah. I was so miserable dealing with this. And again, it's something that I couldn't tell people. Yeah. It's yeah. a secret. Yeah. And I was repressing this and hiding this with every fiber of my being. 
Yeah, I, I would imagine that, I mean, just knowing as a therapist, knowing what it means to your, just the physical symptoms of repression too, right? Anxiety mm-hmm. or depression or stomach issues or whatever it is that might go along with that, that it's not just the holding back of the emotion, it's or the the, the knowing, it's, right. it's all that goes along with that too. Yeah. Well, my parents at age 10 took me to a psychiatric center. Okay. Fairly well known. It was along the Hudson River between Beacon and Cold Spring, New York, about 50 miles north of New York City. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting with the psychiatrist <laughs> and mm-hmm. he's telling my parents, well, he's too young to diagnose as transsexual. Mm. I would say it's just uh, some transvestism. Uh, little boys do experiment. And once he has a career, he has a wife, he has a, a house and a family, he'll forget all about being a girl. Mm. At age 10, I mm. spoke up to the psychiatrist in front of my parents and wow. said, no, I'm a girl. And I was taken from the room. I waited in the waiting room. Uh, we had five sessions or so. Most of them were with my parents. Okay. And on the way home after what turned out to be the last session, I was told, you're going to repress this. You're going to forget all about it. And if you don't, we're going to have you committed and fixed. Oh, gosh. That's terrifying. But that was a 10. Yeah. Yeah. At 22, when I was all set to graduate, <laughs> yeah. I found a psychiatrist who was willing to help me. Mm. And I decided I need to do something about this. I can't continue living like this. It's too painful. Yeah, I would imagine. Hiding, repressing, nothing felt right. I had been doing everything up to that point to check off the boxes to say that I was normal. Right, right. <laughs> Just quote unquote fit in, right? Yeah. I always used to refer to it as normal. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, the uh, psychiatrist wanted to take me to a quarterly meeting of psychiatrists from around the Tri-City area. Okay. The quarterly meeting, I go in as his case study patient that day. Mm. Well, I start talking no more than five minutes or less. And this one gentleman stands up. Now, there's about 15 to 20 psychiatrists, MD psychiatrists in this room, in a hospital conference room. And he stands up and says, I'll see you all next quarter. I have uh, seen and heard all I need to hear. Mm. and then looks at me and says, you're a freak. You should move to New York City and turn tricks like the rest of them. Oh, my gosh. That was uh, pretty much the end of me. Right. That, that, that day, and it pretty much defined the end of me ever attempting to try and transition again. I'd been coming yeah. out to local people that I knew. I had forced myself to go to an all men's college <laughs> just to try wow. and fit in. <laughs> wow. And you see how well that worked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so goodness. I found out from that. And keep in mind, this is back in the days way before PCs, way before cell phones, no internet. Try wow. and find information on this subject. Right. No, no resources at your fingertips for sure. None whatsoever. And I'd been through my college library and a couple of neighboring university libraries looking for information and was pathetically very little. It was a very taboo subject. Well, and even in the psychiatry realm up until relatively recently, it's like there was something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. versus this is who you are and we have to, like, this isn't a diagnosis, right? Well, basically from age 22 to 2015, 2015 is when I hit another very, very, I had lots of dark periods during my life with depression, anxiety, fear, shame, guilt, everything. Yep. 
And I found out November or so of 2014, I was about ready to say, I'm all done. I'm tired of living. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't go on anymore. I had everything mm -hmm. all set up to kill myself. Wow. And I decided I've never gone on and looked online. I don't know if there's anything that's changed since back when I was 22. And that's when I found out in 2012, the WPATH had successfully influenced the medical diagnosis to be a medical condition that right. you're born with. Right. And it's now treatable with hormone therapy, therapy, and any necessary surgeries. And yeah. that ended my desire to end it all. Right mm. then and there. I went upstairs to my wife at the time and I said, remember what we, because after we'd been married for four years and I couldn't take it anymore. And I finally told her about this expecting to be divorced. We didn't get divorced. She decided that we, as long as I didn't do anything about this, we'd stay together. So I said to her, remember what we talked about in 1978? Mm. And this is 2015. <laughs> right. Well, I'm, I'm starting therapy. I found out this has changed. I don't know where it's going to go. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to find a therapist. And I wrote to clinics all around the Montgomery and Bucks County area, the clinics, yeah. looking for a therapist who would be willing to help me and work with me. Mm -hmm. And in January of 2015, I went to my first therapy session, which was huge. Yeah. I walked in, it was an intake session, so it was a little bit longer. I felt a real connection going into that with Stephanie because of her profile, her picture. Mm. I felt the connection with her. Nice. And that was just reinforced on first meeting. And I sat there and I literally, Elizabeth, I just poured my guts out. Wow. I hadn't talked to anybody about how I felt in 45 years. I can't even imagine holding that. So, I mean, I understand why uh -huh. just the, the toll that takes on you to keep oh, that God, yes. hidden. It's just huge trying to hide all of this. Yeah. And it just felt so good to really put it all out there and have somebody actually hear me say the words. At the end, I stood up to leave and we're exchanging comments back and forth. And I, as I'm going for the door, I look down at Steph and she's sitting there with my folder on her lap. Mm -hmm. And she looks up at me and she says, what's your name? And I snapped back, Wendy. Wow. And immediately to my joy, delight, amazement, <laughs> she wrote, crossed out my male facsimile's name mm. and Wendy on my file. From that mm. point forward, I was Wendy. For the first time in my entire life, somebody actually accepted me for who I am without any need to really understand it. Yeah, just, just saw you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By my third mm. session, I went as Wendy. Mm. I, wow. hadn't, I hadn't cross-dressed in over 30 years. Oh I couldn't do that anymore. It just, because my wife had given me permission to do that in private as long as it stayed our secret. Again, another secret. <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. And I hated cross-dressing. It hurt too much to take everything off because then I realized I wasn't being me. Right, right, right. It's like taking off the mask or whatever. That's exactly it. Hmm. When I was dressed as Wendy, I felt real. I felt myself. It felt great. And I just mm. wanted to go see the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
I don't think people can realize the depth and the power that this has over someone's psychological well-being. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think that, well, especially today, we are not living in a world where a lot of people are willing to sort of put themselves in other shoes, like to really empathize with what that would be like to have to, Mm -hmm. well, hold those secrets, but to live your life as a lie almost like, well, not even almost. Right. I mean, I had, I had a client uh, in 2022 that opened up her first session with me. I'm scared. I'm tired of living a lie and I have no clue what I'm doing. Mm. She'd been cross-dressing for years and experimenting and wondering and everything. She was angry, depressed, all of the same feelings that I had. Yeah, I bet. (laughs) And uh, my response to her when she said that to me was great. That's why you're here. Let's get to work. We're going to fix all this. Yeah. And what I discovered with myself and with some guidance from my therapist, and then I took it and ran with it from there, Mm -hmm. was what, what I call the internal work. Mm-hmm. changing the thoughts and the emotions that you have on a daily basis that say, you can't do this. Right. Change those to be more supportive of you going forward. That mm-hmm. changes your beliefs. Yeah. And once those beliefs start to, the old ones that you were carrying that said, I'm too old, I can't do this. Yeah. I'll never be able to pass. Right. Or any of those feelings. Once we get rid of those, it's amazing how everything just begins to evolve. I went from scared to death, no clue how how I was going to do this, to living full time in my own apartment as Wendy in six months. Wow. Wow. And so if you don't mind my asking, how old were you when this, you know, this beginning of your, you know, transition began? I was 67. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I really don't believe there's any such thing as being too old. Well, I I mean, honestly, I swear, I think I say that on the podcast or within my group practice or in my practice too, that with clients that if life needs to change, it can, right? Or if we need to change, we can. Like there's no time limit on healing, on living more authentically, making big changes. Yeah, it should happen. Even Mm -hmm. when you're, especially when you're 67, if you've been waiting all your (laughs) life for it to happen, right? Or hoping that it could. Well, one of the other things I always dreamed of was, because I would... Elizabeth, I would fall asleep at night as a little kid. My parents were active in the Methodist church. So Mm. I did Sunday school and all that other happy stuff. (laughs) And uh, I would fall asleep at night praying to wake up and my body would be different. I didn't really know what it needed to be, but I just knew the way it was was not me. (laughs) <laughs> right. And that my closet would be filled with dresses and skirts and I would be a girl. Mm. And I even had a high school friend ask me, well, if your parents had agreed to let you be a girl, would you have done it back then? Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I really needed to. Yeah. It, this was very strong in me. Yeah. No, I I feel that. And I'm curious as to how this new part of your life has impacted just your overall well-being. I saw my therapist for five years. Mm. During the last, I'd say, two, two and a half years, it was like on a monthly basis. I mm-hmm. called it my check-in. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Love my check-ins. <laughs> nice. And uh But I think we got to almost to the third year and she said to me, you really don't need to come anymore. You're probably the healthiest person I've ever known as as a result of all of this. Yeah. But 
what I learned was how to control my thoughts and my emotions and how to shift all of those to be supportive of me so that I could just go forward. And when I meet people, put out the energy that welcomes them. And that's so different from the way my male facsimile was. Mm. He was miserable. Yeah. Shame and guilt for my parents, shame and guilt for having, you know, I, I was always told, get up, have a wife. You'll forget all about being a girl. Well, every girl that I ever dated and wound up telling about this because I, I just wanted to be upfront with them. Of course, they left, <laughs> yeah. which is understandable. Yep. And yep. so when I decided that after the 1970 event with the psychiatrist, I decided, no, I'll just do what I was told at age 10 and by my parents and anybody else that they ever had me in front of, just go forward, get married, give the whole normal life of a average uh, guy yeah. a try. Yeah. And it didn't work for me. It mm -hmm. really didn't. No. Well, you were not living authentically, right? I mean, you had to shut off that whole part of you, that, that whole who you were. Exactly. There's so, so many people that think this is a choice. It's not. And one of my friends in the transgender community that I met fairly early on, she always used to say, and she's right, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Well, I was going to say, who's choosing who? Well, <laughs> like if you didn't fully believe you were, you know, if it, if you knew you were the wrong gender, of course you would want to make that change. But if you weren't convinced, why would you put yourself through that? Right? Exactly. Like if this was a choice, why would you make that choice? Oh gosh, my camera again. Yep. It's really not a choice and it, it really doesn't go away either. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, you're I'm really evidence living of in that. denial. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I've talked with uh, quite a few people that hit their 50s and 60s and they're saying, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. Well, that was one of the other things that my therapist, Steph, got me through. Mm. During our first two sessions, the guilt and the shame. Yeah. The guilt for having lied by omission to mm -hmm. my wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were married for 40 years. <laughs> wow. Wendy. Oh, but, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. And I told her four years into it, and we just didn't get divorced. She had her reasons, and I had mine. Mine were hopelessness and feeling that there was nothing I could do about this. Right. There were no choices other than to live this life. Yeah. Uh, actually, that psychiatrist in 1970 was right. My options were very limited. Move to a major city, preferably San Francisco mm -hmm. or New York, Manhattan, mm -hmm. and live underground. Right. Right. What I've since found out is there, in both places, there were a large community. Yeah. Yeah. I've talked to uh, quite a number of other people in their 50s and 60s about doing this and all, and they didn't do it either for the same reason I didn't. I really, at that point in my life, wanted to have something in the way of a career and a life that was part of society. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what we're told we're supposed to do, right? I mean, that's that's the... American dream is to yeah, get a job, be contributing member of society, show up, mm -hmm. dress the way you're supposed to. Doing all the things you're supposed to do. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that was not me at that point. So, yeah, yeah. I got by. Yeah. And I did everything I needed to do just to survive. I was not social. Mm. I didn't engage with people and my male facsimile would have never spoken in public like I do now or 
much less come on all these podcasts <laughs> and be totally <laughs> candid and open. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you are coming on podcasts and being open. I'm curious too, like the culture around difference today, just even around being a woman feels incredibly threatening and transgender rights are being challenged and questioned at every turn. It feels like across the United States, at least. How is that impacting you today? just not necessarily personally, but just your overall well-being and how you're feeling? Well, one of the, one of the things that I, when I'm working with somebody going through this and changing their whole mindset around as they get started, mm -hmm. mindset is critical Yeah, because it's our thoughts, our emotions, and our beliefs that will block us from seeing what's possible for us. Yeah. And once we start changing that, the next thing is just to get them used to being in public. Mm. And I have ways of doing that, which involves what I call life tests. Mm. Go out and try something mm -hmm. and keep it simple and all. In the community, they use the word passing a lot. Okay. Do I pass as a woman? Mm -hmm. I don't like that word. Okay. It implies failure. Yeah. It has negative connotations like you're fooling somebody. Right. What I do is I teach them behaviors and mannerisms, differences between male and female. Mm -hmm. There's a whole slew of those. Sure. And the what I set for my personal goal going forward when I started in uh, 2015 was, I don't know if I can do this, but all I want to do is just blend in as any other woman in everyday life. Yeah. Keep it that simple. And then with the continuum of gender, mm -hmm. as long as you are in the 50% mark or a little bit above, you're going to blend in just fine. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be perfect. The word passing means, in some respects, perfection. That's true. Because like, if you're not passing, you're failing, right? <laughs> uh -huh. But yeah. if you're just blending in and all, you're going to have a good time with it. And that's one of the things that I encourage is let's enjoy this. Mm -hmm. I, I see people that are doing this on their own. Mm -hmm. And even with a therapist at times, they're still winding up getting scared. Sure. And what I do is tell them what they're going to face when they go out to try this next life test, when they go out to do their legal name change. I prep them for everything they're going to go through. Here's what you say. Here's how you, and don't worry about presenting yourself to another person. Mm. It's, it again also depends on where you are in the country, but. <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. 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 It's all very doable. Very can be very exciting to do that. As far as what's going on in the country with the laws that people are trying to pass and all of that. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I'm putting myself out very visibly and consistently mm. is I want to inform and educate people in society who are open to listening to what I have to say. Yeah. And hopefully change some pers perspectives and mm -hmm. I don't expect people to understand me. Mm. If you've never woken up in the morning and looked at yourself in the mirror and questioned your gender, most people never do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sure most people never get up and say, oh, I should have been, I should have been a girl or I should have been a man. Yeah. yeah. That, that's not common. So unless you've actually had that experience, I don't expect anyone to understand this. What I 
want to do is give them the knowledge and the experience that I've encountered mm -hmm. to show them that this is real. It's not a choice and it's who I am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really, really appreciate your coming on the podcast and sharing your story and your wisdom. Um, if there was a piece of wisdom you thought was important to share with the listeners, what would that be? Being yourself and being true to yourself is probably one of the most important things in life. And going through the last nine years has not only changed my entire mental outlook on myself and on people around me, mm. it's also a, uh, had a significant and positive effect on my overall physical health. I bet. I'm not churning up all that anxiety and all those emotions that trigger the body to produce all these yeah, uh, chemicals and, and, yeah, yeah, or, right. you know, neuropeptides and everything else that get produced. Yeah. So I've lost almost uh, 70 pounds wow. in weight over the last nine years. I've no longer type 2 diabetic, mm. no longer have the blood work problems that I had. Everything comes back clear. Mm, and I'm far more social than I've ever been in my entire life. Yeah, well, you seem very at ease in who you are. <laughs> but I know being yourself and being true to yourself is so important for your life to, in your life, to be able to achieve what you need to achieve and your purpose. I am taking this as putting myself out to talk with people is my purpose. Mm -hmm. And if I can leave behind some legacy of knowledge of what it's like to have lived for 67 years in the wrong body. Yeah. As, uh, at 69, I went to NYU Medical Center and I had surgery with Dr. Rachel Bluebond and Dr. Lee Zhao. Wow. And I, that was one of the most exciting days. I literally ran into the hospital. Oh my gosh. And on a follow-up visit, I think it was my second follow-up visit, mm -hmm. I drive to Hamilton, New Jersey, take the New Jersey Transit up to uh, Penn Station, get out, cross 7th Avenue, and I'm walking down 30th Street, and I go by this whole block is all black glass, mm. highly reflective. And I'm standing uh -huh. there, in the middle of the sidewalk, everybody's walking by. I'm just amazed. Oh. Wow, you finally did it. You're finally you. Amazing. It just felt so incredible. And that's when I realized during the first probably uh, two years of living authentically as Wendy, mm -hmm. there were times where I felt like an imposter because my body was still wrong. Yeah. I still had, I had to get my birth defect correct. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, Wendy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your story. If people wanted to know more about you and the work that you do, how do they find you? Meetwendycole.com. Awesome. And oh. it's that simple. There's my newsletter and you can schedule on my calendar. And there is a link that takes you to my main website as well. But it's meetwendycole.com. Awesome. Well, I will share that in the show notes. And I just so appreciate your coming on the podcast. Okay, Elizabeth, thank you for having me. I'm always blown away by the wisdom of my guests and their willingness to share their stories of growth and change and transition. And I really appreciated Wendy being so open and honest with us here on the podcast. It feels particularly important to share Wendy's story today when so many rights are being 
uh, minimized or taken away or hacked away at where it may not feel as safe to be in the world living as yourself. And I really appreciate Wendy being here and being so open and honest and sharing with us parts of her journey. And I'm sure the fact that she lived her life suppressing who she really was for so many years, I'm sure there are parts of the story we have not heard. And she shared after our conversation that there will be a podcast series with another host, another podcaster, really diving into her life journey and as she moved into transitioning. So I hope that that will be available by the time this episode gets live because I will definitely share that here. But, you know, you can search out Wendy Cole and find her info if you're interested in knowing more about her and her journey. I appreciate you all being listeners and a part of this podcast. Sharing women's stories feels so important to me uh, in a world where women's rights, along with rights of minorities and the rights of the LGBTQIA community are being compromised and shut down and taken away and minimized. It just doesn't feel as safe as it did. And so I appreciate everybody here listening, tuning in, being a part of this journey of the podcast, listening to these amazing women tell their stories. If you want to get on the list for my newsletter, you can. I I love to write, so I share essays and I talk about what I'm reading and what I'm listening to and a little bit about my personal life, although I'm a pretty private person, but I do share snippets of my personal life there too. If you want to be a part of that, sign up for my newsletter at elizabethcushcoaching.com forward slash sign up and you will get the podcast as well as the newsletter right in your inbox. And I hope you keep listening. I look forward to connecting with you next time here on the podcast. Thanks for listening to the Awaken Your Wise Woman podcast. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Music by Andy Cush, sound editing by Laura Disler, and show notes by Kathy Cush. If you'd like more information about me, Biz Cush, and the resources shared today, go to awakenyourwisewoman.com.